professor of accounting and associate dean for uh, undergraduate studies and administration at AUC School of Business. Uh, I hope you are all uh, keeping well uh, during these challenging times. Uh, it's my honor to welcome you all to our webinar uh, today, which is the first uh, online session in the Willard Brown uh, International Business Leadership uh, Webinar Series. Uh, today's webinar session is titled Getting Ready for Change, something that is extremely relevant in our times, uh, featuring Johan Roos, a professor and chief academic officer at Holt International uh, Business School. Uh, Professor Rusha has a strong background in international academic leadership, uh, scholarship and entrepreneurship. Uh, he has been affiliated uh, with, in various capacities with many prominent institutions uh, such as JIBS, uh, Copenhagen Business School, uh, Stockholm uh, School, of Business, uh, School of Economics, IMD, and uh, the Norwegian uh, Business School. Uh, Professor Rusha would go through the, his presentation and then participants would share uh, their questions or comments uh, in the, the chat box. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. And uh, Professor Rus, uh, the screen is all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure and delight, of course, to be able to be the inaugural speaker in this prominent series at this renowned university and business school. So I will now share my screen with you and talk you through <clears throat> the story I have for you, which is about uh, getting ready for change. And it's very much about change in general. <clears throat> Sorry, I'll do that again. Uh, this is a story about change, and I'll start from the beginning, much easier. So, um, First, let me say that this is a topic that is, of course, extremely uh, relevant to all of us now. It's a topic I've spent some time working in and with, both as a scholar and uh, uh, as a, a, a um, leader. But first, let me say a few words about the school I'm working with now, which is quite an interesting organization, like this fine school of the American University of Cairo Business School, we're also one of these what's called triple crown accredited business schools, which is sort of a nice way of saying that somebody has checked your quality and we among the 1% of the world, seemingly uh, uh, with high perceived quality. We're also an extremely uh, regulated and accredited school elsewhere as well, because we are operating out of the UK with two campuses in London, uh, one north of London as well, Boston, San Francisco, Shanghai, Dubai, and also in New York in the summers. So we are not only, you can say, controlled by some local regulators and ministers of education who all believe they have the right solution to everything. We're also extremely checked up and controlled by all kinds of regulators and accreditators, uh, accreditators throughout the world. Here's just one of them. I'm showing you this to say that our industry, as you know, it's a big industry, the business of business school. It's about a $400 billion industry plus all teaching materials. So it's a significant industry. About one fifth of all students in the world are studying business management, something on any level. And it is highly, highly controlled in terms of quality. Uh, this is also makes it difficult to change things. So I have worked personally in a number of schools, uh, but this is my latest school, it's called HALT. And we made some interesting thoughts. Just over the last couple of months, we changed our student promise to actually be the blunt and be ready for anything. Basically, be ready to change, be ready to adapt, but not only that, be ready to change others as well. So this has really been the student promise that we worked on for some time when this last crisis hit. It is based on, and I'll get back to that, something we call value, uh, core values. You may call it something else. Others may call it guiding principles, and I get back to that. But there's a couple of things there that I believe uh, are for real in the institution I work with for now five and a half, uh, four and a half years. Feels like five and a half. Uh, but there's a couple of things that are listed on the slides, which for once is not just corporate uh, statement or corporate propaganda to say it that way. It's actually quite real in this organization. And I'm, I'm really delighted that it is so real every day. I have worked in a number of other schools, and, and uh, uh, Ahmed mentioned a, a couple of these. Here's a couple of them, and I will just do this. It's not about me. But let me tell you, the ones that are in a little bit red shade here are the ones where I've been heavily involved with, 
uh, or to some extent, to a large extent in four of them, initiated major change projects. And one of them is really a big change project in itself. So I have some hands-on experience of trying to get people to change, trying to get um, initiate change, work through problems with change, see resistance of change, see engagement of change, and really hands-on trying to get to make change works. So this is not just an academic topic for me, it's very much a real leadership topic since I have this role of being part of a leadership team of a global business school. And I I've also been the president, dean, managing director of some of these other schools and institutions. Um, <clears throat> here's my favorite cartoon. I can't attribute it because I can't find who did it. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful cartoon. In the top uh, part, you say, uh, the leader asks, who wants to change? And everybody raised their hand. Of course we want to change. And the second one says, who wants to change? And then there's fewer. In fact, there isn't really one. And then who wants to lead the change? There's nobody left. And you could say we can laugh at this, but it's pretty, in my experience, it's pretty much accurate. Because of course, you know, you don't want somebody else to tell you to change. You want to change and do that. So this raises the question, which I will sharpen throughout my presentation, about how do you really change organization? And this is perhaps one of the most researched topics in the world. You'll find that uh, I can't remember how many millions of, uh, of articles and practitioner-oriented articles or academic articles to have on this. It's just a few of them. You'll recognize probably the one down left by John Cotter, who is one of the gurus in this field. But, you know, leading change, why these efforts fail. And others trying to kind of crack the code of change and rethink how we lead change and apply the science of organizational change. These are just some, some examples. Of course, this is a highly researched topic because it's so difficult. It is so difficult and it's a lot of things doing it. So let me reshape the, uh, reshape the question about how do we kind of change organization to one which is a little bit more specific and which is one I've researched recently. And that is how do you enable people to basically become more ready to change in its two meanings of how do you get people to commit to kind of, yes, I commit to be part of that change transformation project or uh, idea. And yes, I'm ready to take the next necessary actions that I believe are necessary, in fact, to overcome the problems that I'm likely going to face when execution. So basically, how do you get people to turn their hand up when you say, are you committed and ready to act on change? That is, I believe, the, the right question to ask. So, so let me be a little bit theoretical for a while, and then I'll be empirical. So here's a conceptual model I've developed with a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Victor Nelson. And it's called, it's an article called Driving Organizational Readiness for Change Through Strategic Workshop, it was published in January here. This model is just to show you what the literature says about readiness for change. So go back from the right-hand side, readiness for change, well, it, it depends on change commitment and change efficacy. And the second one is really the, are you ready to deal with the practical problem that comes up? Uh, and the other one is, of course, are you committed to change? What drives this? And it turns, there's a number of things that theory says should drive this, starting with kind of motivation. Why am I asking? Why am I involved? Why do I do this? And do I have the safety, the psychological safety to kind of be part of this and have some ideas and perhaps even a poem be sort of an opponent to part of the change. And am I part of the knowledge creation? Is there enough cohesion around the topic and the group and the people involved? And is there enough engagement? And you could say these are the levers leaders should really do when they go want to drive towards readiness for change. And I, I can tell you in my practice as a leader, I, I think of these uh, most of the time when I try to, to do some change project. We run this through a sample of in a particular workshop setting but about 300, 400 people who responded to this perception, of course, of how they did this. And we came out with sort of an empirical model, which modified sort of this a little bit. But basically, we collapsed the two into readiness for change on the dependent side. And we say, what really drives this? Well, in this particular sample, which happens to use the same kind of method to drive change in workshops throughout the world, throughout the industries, but it was the same. Uh, method to, to take away that bias. 
it turned out that motivation is extremely strong. Why am I part of this change discussion? Am I coming to it by free will or am I being forced? to it is it the carrot or the stick that of course drive whether i'm interested in develop some kind of knowledge at all and ready to go or whether i engage at all and of course psychological safety in this case had to do with well depends on how cohesive my group is whether i can do something but it's really about motivation this is not uh, uh, rocket science or, or neural science but it just highlights the very human aspects of change that this is about how do you motivate people? How do you get them involved in coming up with some ideas that will drive all of it? Um, telling people straight what to do from the top may not be the smartest move in any change. Just to be a little bit more uh, specific, if I take the most important factors of each of these, they all were measured in different ways, basically become sort of a checklist was ensure that it's important for people to participate, ensure that it's important for them to, uh, to take a risk during the uh, change discussion, ensure to the extent you can that they get excite excited about the change topic. And you will see that, of course, you know, the group will ideally be a little bit more committed as a team and think about self-interest. How can this help them make a better job? So this is just to think about sort of change as a process. So let me go step up one, back, uh, one level and talk about organizations. And we have the privilege to be hosted by this fine institution. And talk a little bit about how this fine institution look upon the future and really change. And like most good institutions, there's some kind of plan. This happens to be called from good to great, paraphrasing a famous book, uh, which is well known. Uh, and it's called a strategic plan. And there's also kind of a vision in here. And this is a fine pl plan. I to judge or assess more than saying it looks fantastic. It has five sort of pillars in it. And uh, you will recognize these for any academic institution. They will look different in a manufacturing firm or a professional service firm. Here's how it looks like. I don't want to go into this, but just to say, but I bet you that my friend there, Dr. Uh, uh, Sharif Kamal, Kamal Sharif, uh, and his colleagues uh, need to change some of these now. Because when the COVID-19 pandemic hit the world and also hit Egypt and Cairo, I, can, I bet you some of these things, some of these plans were no longer perhaps as valid or credible anymore. Like all plans, I'm not, finger pointing and all, on the contrary, this is for all of us. So all of this, of course, is difficult to do when the world changed very quickly. So you could say the plan has one very good purpose, and that is to say what we should do when we kind of plan the expected, when we know what will come, this is the plan. But what do we do when the plan doesn't work anymore, when we face the unexpected? How do we complement the plan? And uh, like in any institution, I'm sure also in this fine institution, there's been a lot of meetings, discussions, uh, crisis uh, groups, committees, everything uh, has to be rethought. Uh, and um, for those of you who are in the industry, you know how extraordinary uh, big change this is for also the educational industry where suddenly face-to-face -face teaching uh, was just like over a day or a week in our case, uh, March 16, everything online. And that changed a lot of things. So uh, this is now when I'm entering into the world of where we cannot really plan so long. And I will talk you through some of the sort of mindsets about this and go further into the idea of how do we kind of prepare for unexpected change. So many of you have probably heard of what's called the butterfly effect. This is sort of perhaps the most popularized notion of what is called complex adaptive system theory, or, and some people will simplify it into chaos theory, but that's an extreme simplification. The whole idea is about interconnected systems that are so interconnected that if you pull in one end, things change over here. And typically the weather system, uh, our climate is often exemplified by this, where the idea is that a flap of a butterfly's wing in one part of the world 
could create a tsunami or a crisis or a storm in another part of the world because there's so many interactions. And the idea is that in complex adaptive systems, I may say complex system from now on, in complex systems, um, a small change can cause a big effect. And a small, a big change may not cause an effect at all, but the idea is that a small thing can have a major impact. And that is one property of these things. If you think of COVID-19, you could say, well, who would have known that there was some kind of market in Wuhan, China, where there was something going on and something happened. And after a while, there were some reading and writing and some, some discussion and eventually and then whoo, comes up. And that is also uh, another, another uh, property of complex systems, such as organizations, and such as a human society. Um, it is called, uh, there's another thing. And the analogy here is like, if you pile a, a sand, a grain of sand, some wonderful sand outside of Car uh, Cairo in a pile, and eventually you will see the pile grow up and then suddenly it will come down. It will burst one way or another and there will be small avalanches. And then you pile this and then there will be avalanches. So you know the avalanches will happen, but you cannot predict which grain of sand will cause the avalanche. And that is another property of complex system like this. It's called self-organized criticality. A couple of chaps called Buck and Cheng came up with this uh, uh, in the early 90s, in the 80s, actually. So this is also what has happened. We've seen a small things that just took off and suddenly there were avalanches of cases. They were like, whoa, this has grown up. It's, it's exponential growth. This is typically how viruses grow. And this is typically why we illustrate sometimes exponential growth with virus growth. So we know that there's something happening. We just cannot predict when the avalanche will hit us. And this is the same thing for those of you who've been skiing there, skiing or those of you who've been uh, close to an earthquake. We cannot tell when, we can only tell it will happen. So in our case, of course, uh, it's kind of difficult to see, to see uh, that uh, we can go back to anything from now on in our industry. There's been a lot of changes in, in the world, how can we go back to how it used to be? It's much more interesting perhaps to say, what can we do or on a higher level, how can we become more capable of dealing with unexpected events? This is where the terms like resilience come in and I will not talk about that, but it's a, it's a lovely term and I like it a lot, uh, but it's, for me, it's about preparing for the unexpected. Uh, uh, I have uh, studied this many years ago, actually, uh, after the millennium shift, and I've been, I'm old enough to have seen a number of crises. I was part of the 1987 stock crisis. I do remember the dot-com crisis. I just shifted the organization at that time to build a small organization. And uh, I remember that. I remember the 9-11 crisis. I remember the financial crisis. Um, now we've had the biggest bull market for, for uh, I can't remember, 12 years or so. It's been the longest bull market forever. So uh, we've seen these crises. In fact, there's been about 150 financial crises in the world after the Second World War. So crises are nothing new. But I find it interesting to study crises because they are typically unexpected events. And the question becomes twofold. How do we frame the problem intellectually? And what can we kind of, what can we do to deal with it? And how do we deal with it in particular ways? So, uh, sorry. Uh, crises, um, uh, and another term for that is of course disasters. And, and what I will say now is based on a book I did with uh, a fantastic guy who is uh, educated in philosophy, Matt Statler, uh, in 2007, actually, this is some time ago, but we studied uh, disaster preparedness or catastrophe preparedness. And uh, the question was, how do we do to be more prepared for these things? You know, we plan, we plan, plan, and sorry, we plan, we prepare, and we recover. That's the mantra, of course, of disaster preparedness. And those of you who've been the Boy Scouts or whatever similar thing, you know, always ready for life. But how do you do that? 
in complex environments. So I will now give you a conceptual framework, um, which Matt and I developed, and I've just gradually modified it slightly from what's in our book. But it's a framework that is intended to kind of help intellectually people understand what this is about. And I'll go, go through it. Um, framing the problem. So the framework is two dimensional, it's simple, so that we can comprehend. It's like a walking stick, you just lean on it, you don't think it's the truth or anything. But let me show you these two axes. The first one I will call threat level, and that's the vertical axis, the threat level. And you could say for disasters, all kinds of disasters in the world, uh, natural and man made, and you can say they go from no disasters to incredibly unbelievable, in fact, unthinkable crises. And most crises are unthinkable or were unthinkable, but in retrospect, perhaps we should have thought about them. So it goes from zero to the, to the unthinkable. And there, there's some kind of limit for how much we can think about it or even imagine that there is such a threat or possibility. So that's one side of it. The other one is we only have so much resources. So you can say this is resource utilization, resource utilization so we only have so many so many people so many system structures so much things and so much knowledge at the time this time so in a sense there's only so much we can do if you ask me to do a lot more it's impossible i can't do the impossible so if you think of the uh, current pandemic the threat we perhaps we thought about there was a threat that could be pandemic. People have been warning about it, but in general, for most people, it was probably unthinkable to some extent. Unthinkable that this was hit us so fast and so dramatically. Uh, resources, well, uh, we only have these resources, and in my home country, they managed to take away all preparedness stock of stuff a couple of years ago. They probably thought it was too expensive. We have resources to put in. We need resources for other things. So it's impossible to keep supplies of this for any eventuality. Right? And you could say the line in the middle represents um, that the, the need for preparedness goes towards infinity. Right? And there's a famous saying that uh, you, can, you can put you can put 99% of your resources into trying to be ready or prepared for any possibility. You will still be unprepared. And that's probably very true in my, my view. So what do you do? You can do a couple of things. You can try to lower the threat level. So for instance, in the current crisis, COVID-19 crisis, what did governments do and what do governments do? They immediately try to lower the threat level. How do you do that? You work on the R, you remember the R in the equation of spreading things? You confine people, you stop people's movement. You stop people from traveling. You do in some countries in the world, you weld their doors so they can't go out. Or you just say, use your common sense and don't gather in more than five, 10 or 50 or 100 people at a time. It, the strategy is various with different success rates or everything to push down the famous curve so that the health system works. So reduce this and try to kind of go from the unthinkable to the thinkable. That's one strategy, typically you do. And we see this all the time. We'll see how successful it is. The other strategy is to spend more resources, buy more uh, uh, protection material, uh, face shields, whatever, mouth protection, uh, buy anything you can to, to get this stuff and also try to be smarter with your resources, which is, I haven't seen a lot of governments doing that yet, but the spending is enormous to go from the what's possible today to what's almost impossible. So this is, these are the two generic strategies to deal with, trying to reduce this level of stress that you have by trying to be more prepared at the moment right now and deal with this. The problem is that you have um, some risks with these strategies. So go back to the threat levels where we kind of block people, put people in their apartments, say they cannot go out, they have to have a certificate to go out, or even weld their doors. Uh, so they cannot leave uh, or travel or whatever. 
there will be blowback. You've seen this in countries. You saw it in Italy first, probably. You see it in other parts of Europe. You see it in America. You see it in England. You see it in, in other, well, other parts of the world. You can't just lock people up too long. There will be blowback. People say, I don't care. I'll take the risk. I, I just want to go out. I want to do things. So that's a blowback risk you get from that. If you try to kind of spend too much resources now, which is, in all fairness, what I see, uh, and I'm operating in several countries, I see a lot of squander with resources. I see a lot of ill thought through wasting of money in almost pure desperation to buy stuff that are too expensive, they don't know whether it works, and to desperately try to kind of get the vaccine for this now. I'm not saying we should invest, but the risk is squander very, very clearly. And we are faced with what's called diminishing marginal returns, namely the more we spend on it, the less marginal effect we will have on these two things. So that's sort of a way to frame the problem of preparedness for change, unexpected change. And the consequence is that each one of us on an individual level, on a family level, on a uh, um, country level, perhaps on a regional level, have to figure out what's our zone of acceptable risk. We cannot spend all our resources on protection. We cannot you know, uh, have a scenario for every possibility that's out there. Uh, what's our acceptable risk? And you see it's being played out in front of our eyes now with the different strategies to COVID-19. I'm, I'm familiar with what's happening in Cairo right now or Egypt right now but I'm certainly familiar with what's happening in some of the countries I'm operating with. And it's an interesting difference being played out. So that's the framing of the challenge of being ready for the unexpected. I'm using ready and preparing preparedness at the same in the, as a synonym here as well. So uh, how do we deal with it? How do we deal with uh, this thing now when we have defined a zone of acceptable risk? What do we do? do to kind of stretch ourselves perhaps on these axes and within that zone what do we do and frame differently how can leaders prepare to deal and i use these three terms now imaginatively because it's about thinking bigger effectively because it's about using resources in a smart way and responsibly because it has to do with humans with unexpected change. So that's the question I'm going to move into right now. How do you do this? What do you do? And I first want to start with my old friend, uh, David Hurst, who is actually having a webinar in a while called about uh, where he looked at the COVID-19 COVID crisis. And he's using uh, uh, the term analogical reasoning uh, to say that, well, when there's no data, what do you do? Well, you have to think about what does this look like? It's like a, it's the same as, or it's similar to, or it looks like, so analogs and metaphors and other tropes. Uh, and then like, has this happened before? Can we draw, uh, draw insights from the literature? There's even, uh, I think Camus wrote a book called The Plague. Can we learn from that? Can we learn from the Black Death, etc.? What can we do? And I think his way of thinking about this is exactly in line with what I'm going to tell you right now. So kudos to, to David. When uh, Matt Stattler and I studied uh, what these crisis organizations or preparedness, disaster preparedness or catastrophe preparedness organizations did in the aftermath of some serious stuff happening in the beginning of the century, they actually did a couple of things and they did in particular three things so i will start with number one they did scenario work right you remember scenario planning it's an oldie but seemingly a goldie still namely how do we kind of at least outline a few of the scenarios and and the way to do it is really to say what are the major things can vary and then we freeze everything else and vary one of them you remember when shell did this they varied what? The oil price. Okay, what happened then? Big and then the scenarios. But you can do it much more sophisticated. And it's very interesting that in my own industry or in our industry, those of you who are in this industry of higher education, there's some really interesting scenarios for this fall 
and there's coming up now more and more scenarios about what would happen. Can we bring students to this classroom? Will there only be half as many? The rest will be at home on Zoom or anything else, or can we mix the two? And there's a lot of interesting practices coming up now. And we ourselves in our my school, we're of course experimenting heavily now and starting to think through what can possibly work given our values and our promise to the student. And they did so too in the aftermath of catastrophe and trying to be more prepared. So scenario work number one. Number two, these people who's, who were tasked with the idea of being more prepared for the next disaster, they also did not just sit in their offices and warming their chairs, they actually did a lot of work out, if I call it, out on the front lines, where people actually were doing stuff. They work with what's called first responders. These are people like fire uh, men. These are people like people in the medical field, people arriving first, ambulance uh, uh, staff, etc. They followed them. They were there just to get sort of more of a feeling for how it actually works. That's the second thing they did. And the third thing they did, they did a lot of, you can say, uh, gaming. Gaming. And uh, the idea of worm gaming has been with us for hundreds and hundreds of years. And you remember those where you can see old generals leaning over the table, moving tin soldiers back and forth. That is, you could say, a kind of a scenario planning tool, but it's also sort of a gaming thing because you can play with it in a different way, very quickly, move it around, and sometimes actually in 2D, sorry, in 3D. And it turns out that some of the most, if you look at uh, games right now, this is from a couple of days ago, it's still, uh, Minecraft, Fortnite, and Grand Theft Auto that are the most uh, popular games that are out there to play with. This is, of course, where you enter into a different world and you do stuff. So, so this kind of gaming in 2D and 3D uh, is something that actually helped the mind. And I'll go into this and explain why it helps the mind. This is something I've been working on um, for quite some time. Here's, this is from an article I did with two of my colleagues in 2004 called playing with strategy. It's one of the models in there. But this is when we started to play with something which eventually became what's called Lego Series Play. But the idea is that when you, sorry, <laughs> when, you, when you change the, you can say the mode of, I use a difficult term here, mode of intentionality. So I'll say intentions. When you change your intention from just pure work to more playful or gaming activities, you change a lot of things. What happens is that work is always supposed to be productive. That means you have to have an outcome. If you go to your work and don't produce anything, you have not worked, you likely get into trouble. If you go to a football match or a sit down and play a game of, of uh, Fortnite or, or a Grand Theft Auto or uh, an, a construction game, you may or may not get something productive out of it. You have a different mindset. And it is this change of mindset from productive work to open-minded play or game that helps your mind open up. So whenever uh, people in the catastrophe preparedness group that we studied, which is called Center for Catastrophe Preparedness, and this is from the book, they did a lot of these things. And, and that was helping them to see new things. Because what happens, is, and if, also if you change the media, of communication, in this case from just paper or PowerPoint slides, what we do now, to actually playing some in a sandbox or with toy soldiers or with Lego bricks, things happen as well. You start to use your hands and neural connects, neurons connect in your ways. And uh, this is a, there's a whole other story uh, about this. But what's happening in short is when you change into what I call a serious play mode, which means there is like, somewhere in between work and play, this happened. It becomes not just a cognitive process, but it becomes very much a social problem. You interact with people in a different way. It becomes emotionally, you recognize the power of the emotion and how they 
that will help you reach into new levels of your consciousness. You will become more imaginative. You'll start to see things. You'll start to see the same in a different thing, in a different way. And you'll start to also, together with others, sometimes create entirely new ways of seeing the world. And you'll open for things happening fast and quickly, new stuff happening. And that's called emergent behavior, which is also a property of complex adaptive system theory. But this is just to say that there are a number of things that happens when you work this way. Another thing that happen is that, uh, well, you may rec recollect that this is also what happens in drama, in comedy and tragedy. And this is your uh, neighbors, a little bit northern neighbors and siblings in the, the Greek islands, uh, the Ptolemaeans. They also developed a fascination for drama as a way of education as well, because this is during the drama is when you practice uh, your moral judgment, right? Either you cry or you scream or you're happy. There's something on these, the, the two shields there, right? The two faces. And this goes also back into uh, what the famous Greek philosopher Aristotle taught his son Nicomachus about what it takes to be a leader. That knowledge about the science and data is one thing and being smart and cunning is another. But to be a really true leader, you have to kind of have a habit of making decisions and taking actions that are beyond your own egoism. I'm simplifying the concept of promises dramatically now. But this is what it speaks about. And when you do things like what I've just talked about, you actually also say yay to some of the things that are not in a plan typically. Uh, you say yes to some emotional content. You say yes to, to uh, actually the idea of that stories are powerful. And you say yes to saying that rules are good, but we need more like rules of thumbs, heuristics. And this model that I'm showing you here is from a, a paper I published in 2005 by a fantastic colleague of mine, David uh, Oliver, uh, where we studied um, development teams in very high velocity environment in organizations. What do they do when things change all the time? What do they do? And this is what they do. They draw on these things to develop not simple rules, but simple principles that guide their decisions and action when faced with these very changing circumstances. And just so you know that I'm not just talking about free here and I'm doing it myself, not just in my work. I'm also involved in the guys developing some of these techniques. So I'm, I'm delighted to share with you that just a month ago, uh, uh, some people that are uh, actually also connected to, to my school, that's adjunct, called interface.com. They developed a, together with my help, developed a particular application of the serious play method called real-time change, which draws on everything I've talked to you about right now. And it's been in the making for a couple of years, but I'm kind of pleased that it came out during these difficult times. So um, how do you then get more ready for change? And let me give you then my recipe based on what I've said. And it's only a recipe in the simple guiding principle sense. So first of all, appreciate what drives change commitment and change efficacy in people and in groups you work with and you're part of. Remember that bubble diagram up front? Number two, be aware of and know your, you can say, dynamic zones of acceptable risks. I'm part of a number of boards and of every board should have a good risk register, of course, but this is beyond that. But it's a good move to understand your kind of risk register because this is where you have to say, we're aware of these risks, we are find this uh, acceptable, but we can't go further. We can't just imagine more and we don't have the resources to kind of deal with more. And I believe it's good to develop scenarios in all kinds of ways. I'm not vouching for a particular scenario a development method, but I also believe that it's very good to learn from the front line. You know, in our case, we have to learn from how it is to be teaching over Zoom, like now, how it is to have a group of people on uh, a Zoom, for instance, here, a group of people who are on, 
on another learning management system or are in the classroom there. That is learning from the front line to see how it goes. It's also good to learn from analogous and similar settings as well. Learn from the front line, go out there, experiment and do this. And fourthly, yes, play seriously one way or another. I think that's very, very important to change the mode of intentionality and the medium of communication and use an analogical reasoning, which is part of what I've talked to you about and which is part of what other really great people who, who work on this talk about as well. When you don't have the data, when there's no science, what do you need? You need this was also Aristotle to talk about. Go beyond in your analog way. And that's uh, a very, very important part. And I believe it's very important to complement our strategic plans with simple guiding principles. In my case, I believe that some of our values are really guiding principles because our, our strategic plan is one page. Uh, and we work with these uh, every time we refer to these values like uh, principles. As do, do what we want to plan. Does it hold up against those values? So this is where I am right now. So I'll, uh, I'll stop here. And if you have any questions, I look forward to see the chat box. But also you'll find me on LinkedIn. I'm also on Twitter. I don't use it a lot. But I'm on LinkedIn. And occasionally I have stuff there. And I, there's also a bunch of articles I put there as well. So I'll stop here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Johan, for a very insightful uh, presentation. And uh, just to remind the audience that if you would like to share questions or comments, uh, please do that through uh, the chat box. But let me uh, let me take this opportunity uh, since we're hosting you today and being you being a leader of a very prominent international academic institution. So a couple of uh, months ago, everybody was talking about the future of work. Now everybody's talking about the future of education, higher education. And you know, to the extent that some people actually are questioning the ability of certain universities actually to continue in the future after this passes. Uh, uh, so I would like to actually to, to, for, for you to share your thoughts about you know, uh, how things will be. I mean, after this uh, you know, pandemic ends hopefully very soon. Uh, and you know, this being a game changer and what do you think happening in the education uh, landscape. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, it is, uh, it's of course, to some extent, a lot of terrible things have happened in this crisis and uh, the loss of life, uh, we should all be sad about, of course. But you could say all crises come with an opportunity. And I believe that when you look at scenarios for what would happen in our industry, and I, I refer to our industry throughout here as well, just so you know I'm, I'm interested in that. Uh, you could say the first scenario is back to normal. Uh, I don't think that will happen. <laughs> I don't think that will happen. I think it's extremely unlikely we will go back to how it used to be. Because I think um, some of the things we've tried out now such as uh, you could say uh, online teaching in different ways uh, works really well. Uh, I was delighted at our school, for instance, that we are, and we are obsessed with numbers and we measure student satisfaction every week in every campus and every, you know, and we are obsessed with it. We were, we were delighted to see that student satisfaction took an initial dip, but then went up. I do believe it's a little bit of a honeymoon with the technology and the professors. But I do believe the professors also who teach now have started to learn something knew that they some had already and some would have had to learn as well. Crisis tends to amplify trends. And I think we were, we all know we were here already, online were coming and we have to do something. So I believe there's a lot of things that will happen in the online world. I also believe that another scenario is, you know, should we start later than we usually do? And that's in a sense the, the lazy solution. The student really wants to come back into, to, uh, to universities. They, they don't go there just for the quality of education as much as we would love to see that. They go there to have fun and meet each other and make new friends and, and so forth. So I think we just have to bring them back in, even if professors may want to prefer working from home. I think there's a, several schools are trying to kind of move the fall to the spring's term and there, there, will, be, there will be like come and study online the first year, come in the second year face to face. I think we will see a lot of innovations coming now, structured gap years, split curriculum, one part online, another part uh, uh, 
face to face. I will see. I think we'll see a lot of modularity, stackable degrees, also not just outside academia but also inside academia, stackable credit bearing degree uh, um, courses that works. And I, I think you will see even students coming into residence, but they want to learn remotely, so they sit and work around, learn from their dorms. So I think we'll see a lot of stuff coming up here. So I'm quite open for this. And you could say, despite all of the bad things that happen, this is a tremendous opportunity for, for innovation. And that's why we, in our institutions that represent higher education, we have to also seize this opportunity to innovate, uh, get out of our box, think new, and experiment, and be out there on the front line, try things out, and, uh, and fix it which is, by the way, one of our guiding principles in HALT. Try it out, then fix it. Don't sit and be perfect. Thank you, Rachel. Uh There's a question that um, somebody's asking, uh, is there, are there different methods for getting ready for change between individuals and corporations? Uh, that's a, I, I love that question because it's, uh, it's one of the, you know, as a reviewer, when I review research papers, I always pick on people who are, not careful when they scale from a theory developed on an individual level and use it on a social level. So uh, I think it's a well insightful uh, uh, question. I believe that some of the, uh, you can say, some of the theories I refer to are developed on the social level. They really come from the social level. All I have referred to some uh, ideas about psychology, for instance, psychological safety. Uh, and I believe those theories are applicable on both the social and the individual level. The psychology, of course, come from the individual level. But I believe that, that what I've talked about is really on this organizational level. When I think about it myself, if I self-reference, I believe a lot of that is applicable on me uh, when I think of it as an individual. So I would say from a Puritan perspective, this is about social level stuff, sort of organizational level stuff. But I do believe it has strong validity on, on the individual level. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. Um, there's a very interesting question because, and I think I say it's interesting because in the current, uh, during the current events, there's a lot of questioning of, of leadership skills of, of, uh, of leaders of different institutions. Uh, and uh, the question is that what do you do if, uh, if the leader of that institution does not have uh, a vision or a plan. So the constituents, what do they do? What, can they take any uh, other action? <laughs> uh, let's speak in neutral terms, all right? So, but it is interesting because we tend to, to call for leaders <clears throat> that have a vision. You know, and sometimes, and I've been top leader several times, several organizations, small and large, uh, the board and the recruitment committee will ask you, what's your vision for this organization? And I've always been fascinated about that question. It's like you delegate that out to a new unknown person, you know, to, to come up with some kind of dream picture. And vision has almost, uh, almost theological connotation to it. Like, and I usually say there's a thin line between vision and illusion sometimes hallucination, and that uh, annoys some people. But, but the whole idea that you should have a vision, I think works pretty well in stable circumstances. Because then you, you and, and the assumption is that the higher you up you are on the mountain, the, the longer you see. That's, you know, vision, it's about seeing long. I'm not so sure that is, uh, is the uh, primary, uh, leadership characteristic or quality in very dynamic landscapes, if I use the same metaphor. In ever-changing knowledge landscapes, very hard to be, have a vision. You may be sitting on a local peak and tomorrow that may be gone or it's up or whatever. So I think uh, what you need uh, in, the, in these circumstances and actually in complex circumstances is, uh, is the ability to, uh, to both understand and make and work with connections. Uh, everything, think about everything is interconnected and things can happen very subtly. This is the emergent property stuff. It's, uh, it is, uh, this is what you need to do. So the ultimate, I think what we need now is very nimble 
organization. What we, didn't, what we don't need now is big bureaucracies. I think we need to be able to change very quickly. You cannot change big bureaucracies very quickly. And bureaucracies have their advantage because you're routinizing, you're very effective how you work, especially under stable circumstances. But if circumstances are not as stable, which is what's happening in higher education now, you need more nimble organizations. And I have worked with, and I know of, and nobody mentioned anything, organizations that are extremely bureaucratic, extremely bureaucratic because money comes from like mana from heaven, uh, from the state, and you don't have to bother, then why do I need to change? That's very, very difficult. So I think uh, in complex situations, and crises are examples of very complex situations, you need to have, uh, not necessarily to have kind of grand visions. You have to have, I think, uh, the ability to work with and to get work through other people. And of course, you need to be able to point out the direction, but that is not necessarily perhaps the same as a grandiose vision for the next 10 years. Maybe it's about a clear objective for the next three years or two years or whatever. So I, I do have some, some views on that that may be a little bit controversial. Yes, thank you. So I think that's, that's what we call you know, realistic ambitions, I guess, uh, in, these, in these times. Um, another question has to do with with, uh, with the threat and resources. So the question is that do we have to lower both the threat and increase the resource, or we can work on on one of them effectively? No, I, I also th believe that think of it as two uh, two um, not interchangeable at all, but two possibilities. So of course, of course, I think most organizations will say, and I think it's easier to work on the resource side of things where you say we, we try to be more effective in the use of our resources, I think that's, that comes more as natural because nobody wants to squander. Uh, governments, unfortunately, squander more than private organizations because they can tax us and get the money back in. But, uh, but I think the most difficult one is really to work on the, you can say, the threat level, the, 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 the possibility, because it's about the possibility to imagine things. And this is where, boils back to what do you do? So for instance, uh, uh, one of the major conclusions from the notorious 9-11 report when they tried to understand what really happened and why was this threat not detected was that it was a failure of imagination. And I'm quoting from the report. It's a failure of a lot of things, but it was primarily a failure of imagination. It's about, and if you step out of that and say, it's about, a failure of people to connect the dots. And if everybody's stressed and you have no time to think and you're constantly swimming to survive, it is very difficult to connect dots about things outside your narrow field. So this is, I believe, a very important skill in leadership teams. So for instance, in my, my colleague, uh, uh, Stephen, who is the president of Hull, I'm the chief academic officer. He spends, spent a lot of time a couple of years ago on very operational style, things because we had to. But now over the last year, he spent a lot of time on thinking through innovations and working with an innovation officer as well on this. And we, we, we together signif spend significantly time on trying to kind of innovate in addition to, to have the resources and be smart about that. But I believe it's important that leadership team try to figure out how they complement each other so that it's not one person's role and not only the boss's role but also there's kind of innovation a little bit of everywhere and, and if i say innovation i should say imagination everywhere so definitely the most difficult of the two dimensions in my view um thank you Han. um Back to the uh, our industry of higher education, and a question deals with that. So this online learning uh, could be uh, could be cost saving. Uh, however, how do you com how do you balance that with the fact that you lose that face to face interaction with the learners? Uh, there are still some people that are questioning the validity of of, of that model. That it's not the real thing when you sit in front of a screen and uh here to a lecture and that that interaction and that uh, body language cues and a lot of 
things that you feel as as an instructor in the classroom you lose that uh, if you go online so how what's your thoughts on this I think this is uh, highly interesting and very very relevant not just for us in our industry of education but for everybody in every organization because this is about how you hold meetings and how you work across boundaries let's say in different parts of the world you come together if you're in the office and it's easy we know that and we work in our my school in open space offices and have meeting rooms it's very unusual in my industry uh, we meet, we hear, and we see, and we sniff each other. It's all that night. Right. We'll see how it works now. That's certainly going to change with more distance. But I believe also, as I said, this is an opportunity for innovation. We know, and you and I know, Ahmed, and I know from teaching in this format, it is not the same as you say. You cannot smile the same way. You don't look the same way. And we have some people in our, my organization, particularly my colleague, uh, Dean uh, Ted Ladd, who is research dean he's an excellent exceptional teacher in both worlds and I'm, and he's now reflecting on what is it that is different and of course it's the gaze it's the smile it's what you say it's also the group works and everything so i can say our industry right now is going through an extreme accelerated need to innovate and where the people who lead the meetings the professors who lead the teaching will have to be extremely uh, agile to provide value in this new format but it's not you can say it's an extreme example of somebody leading a discussion forum leading a group work a teamwork a project work in an organization where people are in different locations it's the same way it's much easier when the same group but it's more difficult there so we will all have to learn new techniques about how we interact with human face i can sit behind I can move forward, I can have a flashy outside, or I can have a neutral background. There's a whole range of stuff that we need to do now, how we look at each other. So I think we're in the midst of a transformation process to find out how we deliver at least as much value as we did in the more easier face-to-face -face room where we can see, we can, we can read body language, we can play people out in a different way. But this is... Uh, an opportunity to innovate. Thank you very much, Johan. Um, unfortunately, we we uh, it's three p.m., so we actually uh, we're coming to a closure here. And I do apologize for those who shared questions and uh, we do not have time to uh, to respond to them. But uh, Professor Ross, uh, who's uh, shared his contacts, so definitely. Uh, I'm sure that he'll be glad if you reach out uh, uh, to him. Thank you very much, uh, Johan, for this very insightful presentation. And thank you for the participants and their questions. And we we'll look forward uh, for them to also attend our future uh, sessions of the uh, Brown uh, Seminar uh, series. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, stay safe and uh, uh, looking forward to future uh, sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye, -bye. Goodbye, everybody.